vocabulary, our words, and the expressions that we use to, to package those words to describe concepts we're trying to communicate to other people are our windows to our worldview. They betray our fundamental attitudes, starting point, presuppositions of, of life. This lesson is a word study. It's an extended word study, but it's more than that. It's, it's kind of where word study meets practical spiritual reality, plus natural curiosity about a biblical topic. The title is Full of the Spirit. Subtitle, Spiritual Thinking in a Carnal World. Full of the Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit. That's not an expression that is commonly used. Just imagine that we're all contestants in uh, the television show Family Feud. And the host says, Someone is full of blank. What's your number one answer? Well, I know, I know, full of the Holy Spirit. That's probably not going to be the number one answer. In fact, it's probably not your one number one answer. But this expression is actually used quite often in the New Testament. Full of the Spirit. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil. Luke 4 verse 1 tells us. He was full of the Holy Spirit. The seven men of good report appointed as servants, possibly deacons. In the church in Jerusalem to serve the needs of widows, neglected widows. One of the qualifications is they had to be full of the spirit and of wisdom. So if we put out qualifications, have to be full of the spirit. How do you measure that? Stephen, one of the seven, later on. It is said in, in the book of Acts, chapter 7, verse 55, that as the life of him was being stoned out of him, and he was just about dead, that he was full of the Holy Spirit. As he gazed up into heaven and he saw the glory of God, he was full of the Holy Spirit. And Barnabas comes to Antioch, encourages the disciples, tells them to be true to the Lord Jesus. And the summary statement on Barnabas is that he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Now, if someone were to ask you, is, is Ben over here a good man? And you respond, why, yes. He's full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. You might get a funny look. But that may be a deficiency on our part in the way that we express ourselves and the way that we package our thoughts. What does it mean to be full of the Holy Spirit? On the one hand, I believe there are instances where it has reference to supernatural power, supernatural guidance, where a person is, is full of the Holy Spirit and endowed with the capability to prophesy or to work a miracle. He has direct miraculous power of some sort for the revelation of the word or the confirmation of that revelation. We find reference to John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1 and verse 15. That uh, it is said of him that uh, 
for he will be great before the Lord. He must not drink wine or strong drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. John was the last Old Testament prophet and the forerunner of Jesus. And so being full of the Holy Spirit, even from the mother's womb, probably encompasses his prophetic abilities to speak the word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Down in verse 41, essentially the same thing is said of his mother, Elizabeth. Mary visits her. And verse 41 says, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a, a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, blessed is the fruit of your womb. She's full of the Holy Spirit as she says that. And then finally, you know, this must run in the family because Zacharias is covered down in verse 67. And it's a preface to his uttering a prophecy. Verse 67, and his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, and he goes on to describe the prophecy that results from his being filled with the Holy Spirit. So there are times, I think, when, when the filling of the Holy Spirit refers to a special assignment to reveal God's truth or to perform a miracle, to engage with the power of the Holy Spirit in a, a supernatural, miraculous sort of a way. We see that on the day of Pentecost with the 12 apostles. That they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. And uh, there are other Christians some apostles, some others in, in Acts that are said to be filled with the Holy Spirit to engage in, in, in various supernatural activities. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 8, it's Peter. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and people uh, of, and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. And this fulfills one of the promises to Jesus that the apostles would not have to even think about what they would say and how they would say it as they were giving answer as they were dragged before the authorities. Later on in verse 31, same chapter after Peter and John are, are released, uh, when they had prayed, the congregation comes together. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Maybe a general reference, but it may be a specific reference in terms of, of the ability to speak God's word. Chapter 9 and verse 17. Chapter 9, verse 17. You have uh, uh, there um, a reference to Ananias speaking to Saul of Tarsus, whom we better know as the Apostle Paul, about his future destiny. And the Lord's plans for him, Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Of course, Paul was a chosen vessel to bear the name of Christ before Gentiles, and he would be a 13th apostle. Chapter 13, chapter 13, and uh, verse 9, you have, but Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him, that would be Elymas the magician, and said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit, 
and villainy will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord filled with the spirit he gave it to him and made him temporarily blind. So there are times when I think this expression filled with the Holy Spirit or full of the spirit has reference to superhuman abilities that uh, are above and beyond ordinary, uh, even what ordinary Christians could be expected to do in a general sense. But there are other times when I think this expression, full of the Spirit or full of the Holy Spirit or filled with the Spirit, is a general reference to a life closely connected to God, of Christians generally. And I, I think there are uh, many examples of that um, in Acts 13, verse 52. We read about disciples who were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And so I, I think this expression is not always a reference to someone spiritually gifted for a special miraculous assignment. Paul prays that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now I have to tell you that I'm humbled by contemplating how that could be so. Because I am too spiritually impoverished to have a container in my cupboard that can hold such a rich commodity. And it may be that I have to say with the psalmist David, my cup overflows in Psalm 23, verse 5. Because I, I don't have a container big enough to be filled with all the fullness of God. But that is what Paul prays that we might have as a, as a reality in Christ. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, Ephesians chapter 5, Paul prays that Christians might be filled with the Spirit, and this in contrast to being drunk with wine. In uh, Ephesians 5, 18, we have uh, Paul saying, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, being drunk with wine is to be full of wine in such a way that the intoxicating beverage affects one's abilities and there's impairment and there are behavioral implications of that. But by way of contrast, to be filled with the Spirit also has behavioral implications. To be filled with the Spirit is contrasted to be filled with wine or drunk with wine. And uh, so I think that this is a general reference to Christians being spiritually minded and uh, singing the spiritual songs and, and hymns and, and uh, psalms that he talks about in verse 19 there. Even when we are not instruments of divine revelation, we can be filled with the Spirit and the Spirit will comfort us in Acts 9, Acts 9, verse 31, the statement is made that the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and being built up and walking on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It multiplied. When we walk in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, we're full of the Spirit and the church can multiply. Evangelism is one of the outgrowths of being full of the Spirit. Spirit gives us the power to abound in hope. Scripture reading read in your hearing just a moment ago by Brother Jack it speaks of that power that the Holy Spirit imparts to, to abound, to overflow in hope. In the kingdom, Paul says, we have righteousness and peace and joy 
in the Holy Spirit. So being full of the Spirit, we have righteousness, peace, and joy. And our whole outlook on life is fundamentally altered in Christ Jesus. But that all starts when we obey the gospel of Christ. Because when we obey the gospel, we're told to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So whatever the gift of the Holy Spirit is, it comes as a result of repenting and being baptized. And we receive the forgiveness of our sins as well as that gift. And it is a gift. That not only occurs, but uh, the way Titus expresses it, or Paul in the book of Titus, he says it this way in, in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, that he saved us not by works done in righteousness, which we have done ourselves, but uh, by the washing and regeneration and uh, renewal of the Holy Spirit. And then verse 6, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So once again, our receptacles are full. God pours forth the Holy Spirit and, and we are saved. And we have this relationship with God by the grace of God. It's not something we do ourselves. It's something that God confers upon us. And the Holy Spirit is part and parcel with that. And when we obey that gospel, we have the seal of the Holy Spirit, which is a parallel concept to these other two ideas. Ephesians 1.13 says, In him also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And there are implications of that that Paul talks about elsewhere in the book. And therefore, having obeyed the gospel, we have fellowship with God, which is another way of saying we have fellowship or participation in the Spirit. That's what uh, some various passages say. Philippians 2, verse 1, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, there is. If there's any comfort from love, there is. If there's any participation or fellowship in the Spirit, there is. Any affection and sympathy complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Or 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, Paul uh, pretty much closes the book on, on this note that includes the fellowship of the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. All three persons of the Godhead are included there. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And it's the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that is mentioned. We have, we have participation. We've got this connection to God. And the Holy Spirit, the fellowship in the Spirit is uh, part and parcel with that. In fact, we have the keys to victory in Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit, if I understand Romans 8 correctly. Yes, we have to be obedient, but yes, as we're obedient, we have supernatural help. We have answer to prayer. We have God working powerfully in our lives. We have the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And there are implications of that for victory in Christ. Romans 8 is all about sufferings of this present world giving way to the glories that follow and the victory we have in Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit is a great helper in that process. Romans 8, for example, verses 9 through 14, Paul says, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. 
for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, he said. And so if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Holy Spirit has revealed a powerful message that can help us. And the Holy Spirit is present in our lives. And God working in our lives, we have, we have help as we go through the struggles of this life. The last passage we looked at in our recent series on, on 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. This is a new covenant promise that, that we would be temples of the Holy Spirit. You, you don't read that kind of language of the individual Israelites in the Old Testament, at least I don't recall a passage in the Old Testament that speaks to that issue in, in just precisely that kind of language. In the Old Testament, a temple would be a physical compartment or a space where human beings come into contact with the divine. And it's a physical structure, generally, not a person. But in the New Testament, in Jesus Christ, each Christian is a living representative of someone with a close connection to God. That's true of the church generally, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, and 17. It's also true of the individual Christian, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and 20. So an another way of saying that is each person in Christ is a living, breathing, transportable temple. You're walking around as a temple of God a representative of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. And therefore, you are in the Spirit and the Spirit is in you. We live as Christians in the Spirit and the Spirit lives in us. There are passages that say praying in the Holy Spirit, like Jude 20. Or I like the alls that, that Paul expresses in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, as he brings the, the spiritual armor discussion to a close. He says, repeating the word all, praying at all times in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And of the, that would be a good four-point sermon, but the first thing he says there, is praying at all times in the Spirit. So just as Jude says, praying in the Holy Spirit, Paul says praying at all times in the Spirit. It's in the Holy Spirit that we pray. The geography of prayer is such that wherever we are on earth, we are in the Spirit when we pray, uh, which is more important than being at a particular geographical location on, on Google Maps. It's that we're in the spirit when we when we pray. That may imply what John was getting at in Revelation 1 7. I was in the spirit on the Lord's Day. It may well be that he was he was praying and communing with God. We do know in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 that that by the grace of God, we have been raised up with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly places. So we live in the spirit and, and we pray in the spirit. We also walk by the spirit. Galatians 5 is full of this kind of language. In Galatians 5, 16, but I say walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You want to overcome fleshly desires. One of the keys is to walk by the spirit. To bear the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, Paul says, but it's the fruit of the Spirit born in our lives. I've got uh, a lemon tree in my backyard that just goes crazy every year, bearing lemon after lemon. I've uh, got one great bush with several vines kind of extending 
And uh, last year I got about one cluster. <laughs> and this year I've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of grapes. Um, and it's just a natural outgrowth of what that miracle of life does. It reproduces. And the spirit will produce fruit in us. Marvelous fruit when we're walking with God. We'll bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit as we go through life. Paul speaks of living by the spirit in verse 25, same chapter. He says, if we live by the spirit, let us also keep in step with the spirit. Again, in Romans 8, 13, by the spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body. It's as if we're living in an alternative dimension of reality, an alternative universe. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Romans 8 and verse 9. We're living in this world, but we're not of this world. We're living ultimately in another dimension. It's not this physical universe. It's, it's in the spirit of God. So what are some practical lessons? I don't want to get too esoteric here. Um, in fact, I'd like to keep this rather, rather practical. Lesson number one is, is if you're truly full of the spirit, then you do not let the devil invade your holy territory. You're a walking, breathing, living, transportable temple of God, temple of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, again, there are some barriers there. When Peter asked Ananias, you remember that? Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Acts 5, verse 3. This is not what Christians who are full of the Spirit do. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I mean, you, you remember in chapter 1, we, we've already talked about being sealed with the Holy Spirit when we, when we hear the gospel, believe it, respond to it. Well, Ephesians 4 says in verse 30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So you've been sealed. It's, it's the down payment of your, your ultimate redemption in Christ, your ultimate salvation. Therefore, do not grieve the Holy Spirit in your behavior here upon the earth. Because this is holy territory. God dwelling in you, you dwelling in, in God. And therefore, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to gratify its de desires. Romans 13 verse 14 says, nature abhors a vacuum. That's a familiar saying. If you fill your heart and your life with good, then there's no room for evil. If you fill your heart and your life with evil, there's no room for good. It, generally speaking, if you are full of one, I mean crammed, jam-packed, full of one, then the other has no room to barge in. And if you are full of the Spirit, in a practical sense, you're, you're satiated with the things of God. And because of that, you want to draw near to God, and he will draw near to you, James 4 and verse 8. And um, if you're not drunk with wine, but filled with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4, 18, something marvelous will, will generally happen. We will address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the heart or to the Lord with, with, with your heart. That outflow of, of joy is an expression of being full, having that full container filled with all the fullness of God on the inside it has to get out. And it gets out in, in praise and prayer and in song. So really and truly, may the God of hope fill you. May he fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. It's a marvelous concept, really. And I've tried to make it practical tonight. So full of the Holy Spirit, 
Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. Seven men of good report in Acts 6 had to be full of the Spirit and of wisdom. Stephen, one of the seven, was full of the Spirit as he was stoned to death. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And I want to add just one more person to the list. You. Be full of the Spirit. Your whole outlook will change. The way you interact with others will change. If you're full of the Holy Spirit, if you're walking with God, and you've come to God in Christ Jesus, and you're full of that, that hope, the joy and the peace that comes with believing and putting your trust in God. If you've never done that, I think now might be a good time. And let God confer the gift of forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit that comes with it. And sing the song of invitation.